Hi, welcome to Republican Roundtable. We're deep into 2023 and interviewing some of our great representatives, finding out what's happening at the state capitol. I'm your host, Jennifer Zielinski, and hosting with... I'm Diane Knapper. Very happy to be here with you today, Jen. I'm happy to be here. This is going to be a fun time. This is. And very happy to have Representative Walter Hudson from the St. Michael area with us today. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. So, Walter, tell us about yourself. How did you get involved in the wonderful world of politics? Well, there's nothing more dangerous than asking a politician about themselves. I mean, I could go on forever and ever, right? Um, no, we, we, my family moved um, us here when I was 12 years old. I was born in Detroit. Uh, but Minnesota's home, grew up in Cottage Grove, um, married a, a gal from Maple Grove, opposite sides of the metro. Um, and we moved this hither and dither around the Midwest and ended up landing in St. Michael Albertville. Um, we have two boys, 14 and 9, and I've always been always been plugged in to political commentary. Started off listening to Rush Limbaugh, got involved in the Tea Party movement in 2008, um, and I have a background in, in radio and broadcast and writing and, and, and such. And so those two things kind of coalesce very naturally, um, and I ended up having a evening radio program on Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130, for three years about. Um, and then with redistricting this last cycle, every 10 years they redraw the maps after the census and it causes havoc. It's like flipping the game board and all the pieces fall off. And so there's opportunities with open districts for people to run for office who um, haven't run before. And so we have a, a large number of first term members in both chambers uh, this year and I'm one of them. So, so what's that been like being a, a freshman representative at, at the state capitol? It's unlike any other job, and it is technically a job. I'm a state employee as a representative, right? But it's unlike any other job you'll ever have because it's a job where your, your bosses, there's, you have 40,000 bosses and none of them are at the office, right? <laughs> um, and so you could technically do nothing and not get fired. I mean, in two years you probably would be, but for that period of time, your term, um, it really is what you bring to it and what you put into it in terms of both what you're going to be able to get accomplished, what you're going to be able to learn, and what you're going to be able to produce uh, on behalf of your constituents and the people who are depending upon you. So the, the oddity of having a job where typically you start a new job, you have an orientation, expectations are set, and you fall into this routine of producing the widget or whatever it is that you're doing, in this case, it really is a... Uh, self-directed, largely, enterprise where you decide where your focus is going to be and how much you're going to put into it and how much time you're going to invest in learning and doing and where you're going to focus. So it's been interesting. And it sounds like you've been having an interesting freshman year so far or first year at the job. Um, I know that you're getting out there, you're standing up for your constituents. What's been happening at the house? <laughs> Well, what hasn't been happening? <laughs> that too. Um, the, so we have this trifecta, they call it, where the Democrats are in control of both the governor's office, they have a majority in the Senate, they have a majority in the House, which means they get to run the game board. They can do whatever they want, pass whatever comes to mind. And as it turns out, there's a whole lot of crazy that comes to mind, and they've been running full steam ahead with a whole lot of it. So their first priority, the number one bills filed in both chambers, um, was what they euphemistically called the PRO Act, their abortion bill, which codified the most extreme abortion policy, not just in the country, but in the world. I mean, it puts mm -hmm. us right on par with North Korea, China, in terms of just a complete devaluation of unborn life. It, what it does, in effect, is it creates a, it draws a jurisdiction of anarchy around unborn life which is to say it's completely lawless. Like we're just pretending that that part of human development ha has no legal aspect to it whatsoever. It's whatever you can think of you can do. That's quite literally what the bill provides for. So that's, what the, that's how they started the tone down in St. Paul. Um, and it's really, I mean, I don't know that you can go downhill from there, but they've certainly kept it right down at that bottom gutter level in terms of the type 
of proposals that they've moved forward with. There was, of course, as I'm sure we'll delve deeper into here momentarily, um, the trans refugee bill, they did an abortion refugee bill. And the similar theme with both of those is basically here we are in 2023 doing the same thing that the slave states were doing back before the Civil War, which is declaring, basically seceding from the Union and nullifying the laws of other states in direct violation of the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution, saying, yeah, that's, that's cute that you have laws against killing unborn children in your state. That's cute that you've given a father custody of his child over in South Dakota. But here in Minnesota, we live by a different law. It's kind of like taking your kid to Mexico. Once he's across the border, we're not going to fulfill or recognize your rights whatsoever, and we're just going to do whatever we want with your kid because we need to affirm a lie. That's just a couple of small examples of what they've been doing. Right. Wow. That's, that's pretty impactful. What, do, you, do you think that most Minnesotans even understand the impact that this, that this law is going to have long term? No, they don't. And it's not because they lack the ability to understand it. It's because nobody's telling them. Um, that's one of the major takeaways as a first term member of the legislature is that you do not know the most impactful things that your government is doing because the people who you expect to be there telling you day in, day in and day out in the newspaper, on the television, are not telling you. The, the most impactful news is the news you're never told. The most impactful policy is the policy that nobody campaigned on, nobody knocked on anyone's doors and asked, hey, do you think we should do this? Do you think we should do that? Do you think we should raise your uh, license tabs and fees? Do you think we should add a 75 cent per order tax on all deliveries? Do you think we should raise taxes by $9 billion? Nobody campaigned on any of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And nobody's talking about it in the media. So the answer is no, Minnesotans don't know what's going on. And that's why it's so important that we have folks like yourself doing things like this. Right. Absolutely. And getting back to the unborn, we're not even protecting kids anymore in this state. Um, I've labeled them as the runaway Democrats because they can, they're passing every bill possible. It sounds like they're now they're trying to pass these trans bills. And on the outside, it looks like it's protecting kids who might be different or who identify as trans, but it's also now pushing through uh, this agenda that I don't think even the LGBT community even fully supports, if I'm, if I'm wrong or not. The Democrats' greatest asset is ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So they speak mm -hmm. in euphemism, they speak in ambiguous, obfuscating terms, and they don't tell you what they're really doing. So an example of that would be this term, gender-affirming care. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you probe them on it, when you push them on it, they, they do this thing, this rhetorical thing called Mott and Bailey. And I won't go into large detail about it, but the simplified version of it is you put out there, you kind of tease what you really want to do. And then when people react negatively, you retreat into your fortress of, no, 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 no. I really just, it's really just this thing where we're going to, you know, um, let kids wear dresses if they're a boy or whatever the case may be. When in reality, the full measure, the full substance of what it is that they're prescribing is nullifying the parental rights of citizens of the United States. I mean, imagine this. The consequences of legislation passed in Minnesota impacts people who don't even live here. Mm -hmm. right. right. Like Minnesota has canceled the parental rights of people who don't live in Minnesota. That's insane. That's that is scary. Insane. Yeah, um, and, people, scary. and people don't know about it. Right. Uh, and, and for what purpose? For the purposes of gender affirming care, which includes, and it's right there in the bill, it includes uh, both what I consider to be poisoning, which is the introduction of hormones and other chemicals in order to um, nullify or pause, they'll euphemistically say, um, secondary sex characteristics and puberty, puberty blockers, mm -hmm. um, or surgical manipulation. Um, you know, so I call it poisoning and mutilating because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, you're going to pass a law that provides for what is regarded as parental kidnapping. That's where one parent in a dual custody situation, or even a parent who has no custody whatsoever, gets their hands on their kid, brings them over a political jurisdiction line, a borderline. And now all of a sudden they've effectively kidnapped that child from the other parent for the purposes of poisoning and mutilating them to affirm a lie. Pretty bad news, but you wouldn't know about it based upon the rhetoric you get from the Democrats because they never tell you what they're actually doing. Right. You made quite a uh, statement on the House floor about this, uh, talking about the fact that 
it, it is a law protecting a lie. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I think that's something most people don't quite understand when right. you when you get to that um, that part of the conversation. The Democrats don't want to affirm the right. lie, but they want you to affirm the lie. Transgenderism presents the most difficult challenge we've ever seen to the classical liberal order. And let me kind of back up and kind of unpack that. So we live in a multi-ethnic, multicultural, um, you know, we used to call it a melting pot type scenario where there's a lots of different people who believe lots of different things, who all coexist peacefully. We work together. We live in the same neighborhoods. We shop at the same stores. We have a, a kind of a joint cultural experience. We go to the same movies and we get along. More or less, we get along. The reason we're able to do that is because we've bought into this kind of central Western premise, which is that you ought to be able to live your life according to your own values and to, to sincerely affirm your own beliefs, but you don't have the right to impose those beliefs on others. So you can't come to me as, you know, let's say you were Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. You can't come to me and demand that I renounce Christ and convert to Islam, right? Um, and vice versa, I can't come to you and say, I want you to denounce the Quran and convert to, to Christianity. Um, transgenderism has gotten, has so far at this point in our history, has found this way to come at that from another angle and say, we're the exception. Here's our preferred pronouns and you're going to use them. Mm -hmm. you, you are going to surrender your grasp of reality. You are going to effectively renounce your God. You are going to convert to our point of view with no backing in physical reality because we all know, even they know, like you wouldn't need to have gender affirming care if your gender identity was manifest in physical reality. The fact that you need to intervene with chemicals and surgery is an admission that this isn't really a thing in the physical world, right? So you're coming at me with a complete lack of validation in reality for your claim and demanding that I affirm it. And my answer to that is no. You don't have the right to do that. You don't have the right to demand that I renounce my grasp on reality in order to affirm you. We're seeing that in workplaces where now, you know, people are being forced to put their pronouns in their email address or right. whatever Zoom or Teams they use, being forced to introduce themselves when most most people just, this is who I am. And at the end of the day, if you refer to me by the different pronouns, I'm not, it's going to roll off my shoulder. I, it's not going to affect me. <laughs> I don't think most people are going to confuse my gender or mm -hmm. my pronouns. But at the end of the day, if somebody gets it wrong, it's not going to be the end of it. But now they're trying to squash our speech. And it sounds like that's even happened to you on the House floor. It's <laughs> funny you should bring that up because literally last night, as we were debating on the House floor, um, one of the new provisions in the public safety, the Judiciary and Public Safety Omnibus Bill, is they are creating a new database of non-criminal incidents of bias. Now I have to unpack this because these are words that don't have meaning to normal people, all right? Mm -hmm, right. What we're talking about here is, so you've heard of hate crime, right? Mm -hmm. So hate crime basically being the idea that you commit some sort of thing that has an underlying crime, assault, murder, damage to property, but your motivation was some bias and there's certain categories that we associate with that, sex, race, what have you. Um, what they're expanding is not only are they adding categories to that list, gender, gender identity and such, but they're also saying in addition to crime, we're also going to start keeping data on incidents. So one of the examples that was offered in committee by the commissioner of um, human rights was somebody standing on a street corner and a car driving by with their window open and somebody shouting a racial epithet out the window. So that, that there, no crime has been committed there. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that's an incident of bias. And so now the person who it happened to, because they feel sad, can call the Department of Human Resources and file that as a report. And they're going to keep an aggregate database of all of these incidents that are completely arbitrary. I mean, that's a subjective judgment of, oh, I felt bad because something happened. 
um, completely unvalidated, like nobody, no third party looks at the facts and determines, yes, and indeed there was bias that took place here. And what possible purpose could you have for that information? Completely arbitrary, subjective, unverified, non-objective information. Well, they, they just want to know what's going on. They want to see where the problems are at. They want to identify where the problematic communities are. This is government we're talking about mm -hmm. here. And that's extremely problematic. And indeed, last night on the House floor, one of the scenarios that was acknowledged by one of the authors, one of the chairs of the committee that developed this bill um, was misgendering. So intentional and, and intention doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? So you could be a card carrying woke leftist and you accidentally say he instead of she when the person identifies as a she. And that qualifies as an incident that can be entered into this database, and now you're part of the government zeitgeist of hatred and bigotry that's inflaming a community. That's where we're at. So that sounds like that obviously goes down a very slippery slope, and we're, you know, we all know what happens on slippery slopes. People get hurt um, at the bottom of them. This sounds like a way to then enforce or enact laws in the future that are just as arbitrary and capricious and that have no foundation other than someone's feelings got hurt. Um, how do we counter that in our, in our culture? Because I feel like our culture is going down this road of we care more about our feelings than about reality, um, what we'd like to see happen, as opposed to things that genuinely have to happen in a certain way because of the physics of reality. Um, we say no, and we mean it, and we back it up with uh, just intransigence. I'm not moving off the position that reality matters. We have to become more intransigent than they are, and that's going to be a hard task because they are deeply intransigent. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is, you know, people talk a lot about the hill to die on. This is the last hill. Right. Because if we surrender the idea, if we concede the concept that somebody's arbitrary claim that has no basis whatsoever in physical reality, by their own admission, mm -hmm. again, um, if we surrender that on the authority of that, we have to submit to whatever they ask for, th there's no such thing as a right. We no longer live in a world that's governed by reason and therefore cannot achieve justice in any form. We All we can hope for is to uh, land on the roll of the dice on the right side of the mood of the governing class. And that governing class is going to be dictated by whatever the, the woke caste system of the day is. And that's not an acceptable way to live. And the, what gives me hope is there's a whole lot more people, even though they don't know the full depth and scope of what's going on and don't appreciate it quite yet, everybody I know, for the most part, agrees that there's men and there's women and nothing in between. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that they're willing to yield to these demands, it's because they're trying to be polite, it's because they're operating under, it's because, ironically, they're operating under that classical liberal order, that social contract that says live and let live. Right. And so they don't even perceive the threat. They're like, well, this is just what we do. We recognize the, the, the beliefs of others. But this is different because it's not just the belief of others you are required to renounce your belief. And that is their demand. They're, mm -hmm. they, they are not offering, hey, this is what I think, but whatever you think is cool. They're quite explicitly saying the opposite. This is what I think, and you're going to surrender you, what you think to mm -hmm. affirm what I think, or else, under threat of losing your job, being assaulted, having six people shot in a private Christian school um, in Nashville, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, they mean business. And so we have to mean business. That's the only way this is going to stop. And we're seeing that affect the schools right now. Just everything, whether it's, and I don't want to, you know, get down on teachers because we have great teachers who actually teach what they need to and get kids educated. But now we have teachers pushing this same agenda that we have the runaway Democrats pushing, um, whether it's, you know, through sports or through education, through essentially screwing kids up so they develop those different beliefs and differ from their family. Are we seeing this as they push it through the schools and push it in education? 100%. In fact, last week, um, they passed their education omnibus bill and wrapped into that 
um, was a provision called ethnic studies. Mm. Now that sounds sweet, doesn't it? Yeah. We're going to learn about all the ethnicities. It always, always sounds sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would love to learn it, but I take it it's not what it sounds like. It sure isn't. Um, and again, that whole Mott and Bailey thing, you know, as soon as you react to what they put out there, they retreat into their fortress. Mm. And the fortress, uh, they're saying, well, you know, we're just going to like have different ethnic dishes and people can come in their traditional costumes or attire um, and we're going to talk about history and we're going to learn the complicated history of World War II and talk about internment camps for the Japanese and such. Um, but, but that's just, that's the safe little mot, the fortress. In reality, what this is, and it's right there in the bill, is they're going to set up these um, boards, these ad advisory boards to dictate to school districts what their curriculum ought to be, and the objective of the curriculum is going to be to affect what they euphemistically call anti-racism. Now, onto itself, that word anti-racist, well, sure, why not, mm -hmm. right? Well, I'll tell you why not, because they define it. And what they define it as is working to redistribute power and resources amongst racial groups along racial lines. And so, where the, the objective of the school district and its curriculum is no longer going to be teaching kids academics, providing them with the knowledge and skills necessary to successfully negotiate reality. The mission is now going to be affecting the redistribution of power and resources along racial lines. Now, how do you do that in the scope of an education system? Well, you do it by taking a look at the aggregate statistics and saying, gee, you know, on the whole, we've got this achievement gap where white kids are doing better than black kids. We should probably put the brakes on teaching the white kids. <laughs> Right. Let's throw a little racism into our anti-racism. Yeah, exactly. No, no, and that's literally what it is. Is every a good rule of thumb is to just take the opposite of what they say they're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. and presume that to be both the goal and the end that they're mm -hmm. going to affect. Right. And indeed, this takes our schools and turns it into factories producing racists. It's not just going to be like a side effect of oh, there might be an increase in racism. No, the objective is to churn out a graduating class that gets graded on how racist they are, and the most racist will get the A's. That's what the system is going to be. Um, and so, you know, going back to the transgenderism, that's gonna be factored into it, right? Like, you're, th would they get that type of control um, under this premise that of equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and our goal is not to achieve things, build things, make things, uh, accomplish missions. Our goal is to level the playing field amongst the different political castes that we have arbitrarily constructed, and transgenderism is right there at the tippity top of that hierarchy. They, they deserve more than anybody else to compensate for their overwhelming oppression. And how are they oppressed? By me saying no when they demand I renounce my God. So where does that, where does that take us ultimately as a state uh, to, if we're not building things, if we're not um, teaching our children how to think critically and reason and deal with arguments that they might have with their with their friends in the fifth grade, like most of us normally did, how do we go through puberty and, and understand that's just a fact of life and it's just a part of life? How, what does that mean for us down the road as a state? If we if if we are leveling the playing field, leveling it to what and and who wins really? Well, I told you at the outset that I was born in Detroit. There you go. That's that's <laughs> where we're headed. Um, and not necessarily Detroit of today, because I hear that they've actually been doing some positive things and bringing that city around, but the, the Detroit of my dad's era, mm -hmm. where it had once been, you know, Motor City, right? Mm -hmm. This thriving center of industry um, that was, was rooted in the, the capitalist dream and the American dream and people trying to achieve their best good. And they tried this under this premise of we need to equalize everything. We need to make things great for everyone. And that's our objective. Not producing stuff, but distributing stuff. When you go from producing to distributing, you run out of stuff. Out that's kind of that's right. how that works, right? <laughs> Someone's money runs out at some point. Right. Yep, and that's exactly what happened in Detroit. And I remember as a kid, you know, I, we lived, the first house that I lived in was very modest. The neighborhood mm -hmm. was very modest. I went back there maybe 15, 20 years ago. And as a grown up on streets that I had walked and biked as a kid, and if I hadn't, if I hadn't had that experience of growing up there, I wouldn't have gotten out of my car. <laughs> Right, because right. it just felt like not the type of place you want to stop. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that is a byproduct of 
for, of not just the, the economic impact of these policies and choices, but also the psychological impact on people's minds and the spiritual impact on their souls when you convince people that they deserve things by virtue of the fact that they draw breath, um, that, they, that they have no responsibility for producing it for themselves or that, that their responsibility is very limited and that they really ought to be looking to the rich or the corporations or so, some other person. In this case, the modern manifestation of it is white people, cis people, straight people, Christian people. Mm -hmm. They should be producing things for you. And if you're unhappy, it, that's your unhappiness is directly proportional to how much you're being oppressed by the other. Yep. And we've seen that as they, you know, downplay capitalism, downplay everyone else. Um, Walter, as we talk about, I don't want to say the doom and gloom, but what we're facing at the state, how can any viewers take action? What can our yeah. viewers do to turn the tides? Well, I'm really glad you asked that. So it's the, my, one of my biggest frustrations um, in this role is not what I'm seeing from the Democrats. It's not... Um, what I see from institutions like the media mm -hmm. who don't cover us fairly and, and um, aren't telling people what they need to know. My biggest frustration is with my friends. It's with my fellow Republicans. Um, it's with, it's with uh, folks who, are, who desperately want to see things change but have for, for one reason or another um, provided excuses for themselves to not do what it's going to take in order to change it. The answers are very simple, uh, and they fall into the category of cultural and electoral. Culturally, I, I like this term, a gallon or BPO, you came up with this, bloom where you're planted. Wherever you find yourself, God gives us ministries. Mm -hmm. They're right there. Mm -hmm. Wherever you find yourself, f grow into your role to your fullest capacity with the aim of doing his will, right? Um, and that's going to have the impact, the effect of through, through social contagion, a positive form of social contagion, inspiring other people to do the same. That's one. On the electoral front, we got to get serious about winning elections. I got to tell you, nothing has taught me more than um, being in the legislature that having the right argument and having a great argument and delivering it well doesn't matter at all. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the votes, doesn't affect anything. In politics, the only thing that matters is having the votes. And in elections, that means putting ballots in boxes. And our side has gotten tremendously discouraged over perceived electoral fraud and a lack of electoral integrity. And I'm not telling you that those things aren't real problems. They are obviously problems. Mm -hmm. What I'm telling you is that we can't do anything about those problems, anything meaningful, without first winning elections. And that means we have to figure out a way to win by the skewed rules that have been written by our opponents. And I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying it doesn't suck, but it's do or die. Right. So that's where we're at. Well, thank you so much, Representative Walter Hudson, for being with us today to talk about the issues in your first year as a freshman legislator. Oh. My pleasure. I'm Diane Knapper, co-hosting with Jennifer Zielinski. Thanks for joining us on Republican Roundtable. We'll see you next time.